And so I'd like to introduce Real Miller, who's going to be speaking to us um, on this topic that's up on the screen. To say a little bit about Real, I, I envy him for his job. He, he's been working with the future for the last 30 years. I think many of us have been working with the past and maybe the present for the last 30 years. So <laughs> it's very envi enviable. Um, he's a PhD economist, um, worked in the futures group of the OECD for a number of years. And uh, for the last six years has been uh, freelancing working with governments, working with uh, businesses, working with people who want to examine their relationship with the future to see what more might be possible. So, Real, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Very good. Um, it's a tremendous honor and privilege to be here. Um, to speak for my whole body, uh, as has been uh, something we've been trying to all do, I think. Uh, I can say that on the first night that I was here, I went into the courtyard at New College, and it just turns out that that's the courtyard where they've shot the film uh, of Harry Potter. And it just so happens that at the moment, I'm reading Harry Potter to my daughter, who's 12 years old, my youngest. And I had this moment when, frankly, I almost left. I thought, I'm, I'm just going to leave. Can you, is it, it's, it's not good? Okay. So I was, I was going, I was just going to, I just, I thought, I better, I better leave. And why did I think that? And I thought that because Harry Potter is a story that you probably, most of you have heard about or know about, but it's a story about a young boy who saves the world from evil. And I had this feeling all of a sudden that here I was on some sort of mission that we were all here together to save the world from some evil. And that made me very, very, very nervous. Uh, that, that, I didn't feel comfortable with that. Uh, and I think part of it is, is, is about the, this, the bounce at the bottom of the U, which is, if that's what we're doing, then I think we're doing the wrong thing. And that made me really, I, I, I don't want to be part of that. And so, but I don't think we're doing that. Although the temptation to see that is very powerful. And I think that one of the ways to begin to appreciate that moment of willingness to risk something new is to equip ourselves both emotionally and intellectually to begin to create and develop new words, new language, we've already been talking about that, and to do it in a way which allows us to get some distance from the systems that we're in. So I'm going to take you very rapidly through a process of thinking about the future and using the future differently. And I want to start with a point that's already been raised, which has to do with complexity. This is from a philosopher, a French philosopher called Edgar Morin, and it's, we are blind to the problem of complexity. This blindness is part of our barbarism. It makes us realize that in a world of ideas, we are still in the age of barbarism. We are still in the prehistory of the human spirit. Only complex thought will civilize our knowledge. Now, I have to say, what then is this complexity idea? Is it 10 billion products? I don't think so. I want to suggest that complexity is something else. Complexity is actually, to me, the most wonderful aspect of our universe, the most fantastic thing. And why did I say in the title to this talk, Embracing Complexity? That dangerous 10 billion product thing, that, that, that monster? No, not at all. It's our greatest friend. It's, it's in fact, it's at the core of all our values because it's about novelty. It's about emergence. It's about things that come from that moment at the bottom of the U when all of a sudden you can grasp. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do it. I don't know exactly why, but it's a whole set of things, and you do it, and it emerges. And when we were doing the Lego at our table, that's exactly what happened. The, the moment you started to construct something, that Lego construction, something you said, where did that come from? That idea to do it this way, to do it that way. Sure, we have lots of symbols in our heads. Lego are 90 degree pieces. They're quite constraining. But a moment of intuition. Aha, this, that, and then you commit, and then you do it. But the vocabulary is something we can work on. It's something we can develop. Lego was constructed. The words and concepts that Pear put up on the screen were ideas and concepts. 
those things we can work with. So when I start to think about complexity and embracing complexity, one of the things that's very important for me is to understand this idea of the end of certainty. And this transformed, you know, I have a social science background, PhD in economics, so causality, modeling, economic thought, and the whole trends, inflation, unemployment, all those things. But as I started to look at the, the literature, as I was trying to understand how some place like the OECD thinks about the future, and the OECD thinks a lot about the future, but generally speaking in one particular way, I'm afraid that, sorry, it's difficult to read, but I'll read it out to you. We are now able to include probabilities in the formulation of the basic laws of physics. Once this is done, Newtonian determinism fails. The future is no longer determined by the present. What are we doing here? You're all here now in the present because you think it has some impact on the future. If the present does not determine the future, what are we doing? Where's our volition? Where's our will? How do we change things if the present doesn't determine the future? It's frightening. We're at a turning point, the beginning of a new rationality in which science is no longer identified with certitude and probability with ignorance. Science is no longer limited to idealized and simplified situations, but reflects the complexity of the real world, a science that views us and our creativity as part of a fundamental trend present at all levels of nature. Creativity. What does that mean? It means that the laws are not fixed. They change. Now, maybe on a, the scale of physics in the universe, it takes millions, hundreds of millions of years. And on human scale and human systems, much less. But it means that our creativity and ideas that come up, like maybe we should build a nuclear bomb, changes everything that people think after that. And that alters one of the fundamental things. It means we must resign ourselves to the inevitable. It is the real which makes itself possible and not the possible which becomes real. The truth is that philosophy has never frankly admitted continuous creation of unforeseeable novelty. What does this mean? Is it, it means, in, in a very simple way, to give you a simple illustration, if you're going, trying to find some place, and you turn right, and you go right, and you discover that that's not where to go, you then realize, oh, I should have turned left. The possibility is in the past, because reality has given you new knowledge. This universe is rich in information and knowledge. Each of us has a local root. We know things. We can touch our deeper, more complex, more holistic, not just conscious aspects of what we know about reality. But how do we bring those into what we do? If we're planning in advance, if we think we know what the future is going to be like, we're going to plan things which, in fact, don't correspond with what actually happens. So how can we take a position that allows us that fluidity, that openness, this willingness to embrace novelty and creativity. By the way, that was by Henry Bergson in The Creative Mind. So to me, this is something that is really quite, in many ways, counterintuitive. It pushes against our way of thinking. And that's why I put up the picture of the Ptolemaic system. You know, that was the system where the Earth was in the middle and the sun went around the Earth. And now we have, we understand, of course, with the Copernican system, that it makes a difference. And you have a Copernican breakthrough. And it makes a difference because when you think about something like this change in the way we use and think about the future, it alters what we see, what we imagine, what we resist. In other words, what we're afraid of, what we're trying to preserve, how we preserve what we want to preserve. What are we trying to preserve here? What is it that we want to save from what exists today for some future? And how we see that. And it changes the conditions of change. And this is a fundamental aspect of the world around us. The conditions of change change. How do we then cope with this? If we accept this starting point, that the future does not exist but can be, how do we make it actionable? We're here for action. If we don't know the future, if the future is emergent, if the future is full of that wonderful, amazing thing called novelty, what do we do now? Well, I think there are lots of things we can do. And one of the things is to be more sophisticated in the way we use the future. I want to talk about something called futures literacy. And futures literacy is a capacity, the capacity to use the future. 
There's lots of reasons that I could go into why I think that's important now, why we're able to do that now. But let me just go through very briefly what it means. Futures literacy is the capacity to tell anticipatory stories. Stories are very important. Using rigorous imagining. And rigorous imagining is sort of a contradictory thing. But there's a huge rigor to what we describe and to what we imagine. The Lego exercise was a perfect example. Lego pieces are rigorous constraints. Our imagination is not just into an empty sphere. Our imagination functions with the words we have in our heads, with the images we have in our eyes, with the feeling we have in our gut. And so the capacity then to use that as we have been doing here by sharing knowledge across a community is what futures literacy is all about. It's about collective intelligence. It's a way of internalizing the constant development of our understanding of the emergent present and our changing anticipatory assumptions. Anticipatory assumptions are fundamental to action and choice. We were told to bring an umbrella or, a, or a, a, a raincoat today. Well, it was very concrete. It means you have to carry it with you because we anticipate rain. Anticipation and the assumptions we make, the assertions we make about the future, even if we don't know whether they'll be true or not, change what we do now. So anticipation is really fundamental. So Bugs Bunny anticipates. He's a perfect anticipator. And I use this illustration to try and get to the idea of thinking about anticipation as something that has a systemic attribute to it, that we can think of anticipation as a systemic process that is not just volitional and conscious. So a tree anticipates winter. The result of an evolutionary process has given that capacity to the tree. It's not a conscious process. This is the anticipatory system from Robert Rosen, mathematical biologist. The emphasis I want to put on here is on this model. This aspect of how we construct and use the future. And what I'm appealing to you about here is that we need to think more deeply about the way we construct that model. In other words, the kind of anticipatory way of thinking, how we divide up the specific aspects of the future. And I want to get to that because I think that this is really critical and I think we've already seen it here over the last uh, two days, which is there are different dimensions of the future, not just one. And that if we don't distinguish those different dimensions, it's very difficult for us to actually make progress in the area that we're trying to make progress in. I want to distinguish three dimensions. One is contingency, a tsunami, a future that, a terrible future that you prepare for that might happen, or a good one if you win the lottery and you become very rich. We are actually quite good at dealing with this. We use simulators. And the fantastic design exercise that we had on disasters that Pedro led uh, the other day showed us that we can define the issues and then rehearse what it takes to address those issues. And we can become much better at the transparency and the reactivity. We are, as a species, actually excellent at this. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. The other dimension is this one. And we're also very good at this. And it's, it's very deeply intuitive. It's, we're all here in the room. Everybody came back from lunch. We were programmed. We said, we'll be there, and we were. We knew what the goal was. We knew what the rules were. We knew what the resources were. And in this way, we, in effect, decide that the future will be the way we want it to be, regardless. And in that sense, we try and inhabit, colonize the future. And we're very good at it. What we're much less good at, oh sorry, and I should say that this to me is not complex. It's complicated. 10 billion goods can show up in New York City because we have supply chain management and specialization. That's not complex. It's complicated. That's something we can manage. We know how to do that. What we're much less practiced at is actually embracing ambiguity, welcoming novelty, rethinking the way in which we look at the present and understanding the world around us. So I put up a painting of the Middle Ages. It's a painting that's very hard to describe in many ways. There are people there, but we don't know what they're doing. We don't know what kind of language. And the reason I put that up is because I want to emphasize that this is very easy. This is Shanghai with flying cars. 
We've been doing that for you know, 100, more than 100 years. We've been projecting that kind of future. That's an extrapolatory future. It's bigger, better, faster. Or it's the magical wave of the wand and all of a sudden all the problems with energy will disappear because we'll find a perfect energy solution, no more carbon, and everything will be fine. Those kinds of bigger, better, faster, extrapolatory futures are easy. And particularly because we're all technology fixated, we do that all the time. I'm not saying that's not important. But if we want to change the way we imagine the future to understand systemic change, because there is systemic change happening around us, we need to be more rigorous. And that's what we're doing, actually. We're engaged in what I would call a rigorous imagining exercise here. And a rigorous imagining exercise allows us to develop richer descriptive stories. And that's what I've been learning from all of you. We've been exchanging ideas, contexts. We've been telling stories about what we do, what we hope, conditions. And therefore, we've been generating amongst ourselves new knowledge. It's composed of three very standard parts. Futures literacy, using the future for knowledge creation and capacity building. Narrative capacity, which is about storytelling. Collective intelligence, which is about evidence. You know, I, the OECD is this bastion, the Organization for Economic Cooperation developed this bastion of data. All these big stacks. In fact, I went to do my thesis on national income accounting at the OECD. So national income accounting exists in these big warehouses of databases. That's great. But the evidence that's actually of what's going on here and now doesn't have categories yet. What we're discovering, what we're defining, is evidence, but it's emergent. Its meaning is cre being created by us here and now. It's part of the you. And then there's the capacity to reframe. And the capacity to reframe does require, like any creative act, a discipline, a challenge, a point of, a point of view to be able to push ourselves. So now I'm just going to take you very, very briefly through an example of that. I have had the privilege of working for many years on a model um, of this kind of Rip Van Winkle transformation. You can't really see it. Rip Van Winkle is an American fable about a fellow who woke up 25 years after the American Revolution and, saw, and, and said, oh, wow, what a big difference. It is sometimes hard to think outside the system, to break outside the system. This is based on work. Uh, that started at the OECD in the late 90s. There's books available for those of you who are interested in the technical and academic references. They're all there. Uh, we can go into them. But what we're trying to imagine here is transformation on a scale that's happened before. We've seen this. Some countries are here. Some countries are there. But we know this story. The story of the industrial society and the agricultural society. And we sit, and this is one of the things that made me so, I think, nervous the other day at New College in the, in, the, in, the, in the cloister. We are at a moment of tremendous fear, which is defensive, of a, a sort of panic, backward-looking, reactionary. And instead of using our imaginations, we have a poverty of imagination. And the poverty of imagination is to say, well, look, if, industrial if there's an industrial decline in North America or in Europe or if Germany has no more car manufacturing, Germany has no more car manufacturing, we're going to be poor. And the only way to get rich is to be industrial, to industrialize China, brick. That's what we have to do. We'll converge. We'll catch up. We'll do it faster. We'll do it better. We'll do it greener. But we'll do the same thing. We'll do it our way, but more or less the same thing. What a poverty of imagination. Now, I don't have the right words, and I don't have the, the vocabulary of tomorrow. It doesn't exist yet. But there are other things we can do to create value. And I want to push you to rethink the fundamental economic foundation of the way we imagine the future, which is, why do we need jobs and enterprises? Why do we need jobs and enterprises? After all, we invented them. Are they really so necessary? Is that production system the only way to create wealth? So if I can push you to think about wealth creation just a little bit differently, I want us to think about unique creation. How we organize that value creation and the predominant type of economic activity. So we're talking about compositional change. I'm not saying that mass production will disappear. But I'm saying we're going to be successful with mass production. And what will happen over the last century or more, is that fewer and fewer people will need to do it because it becomes more productive. To push our imaginations, we need tools. Here's one example. It's not the only one. And by the way, 
let me make it very clear. I am not predicting these things. I'm pushing you into a reality that's different from the one we exist in. I'm trying to challenge you to think about the assumptions you're using when you start to think about action. Because you have those assumptions in your head about what the economy must be like, what society must be like, how we are going to organize ourselves. And so if we begin to push our imagination and we think about the organization of value added, and then we think about how we build the relationship of the community to production in terms of high learning intensity, low learning intensity. We have the mass era worker and consumer, the informed shopper and team worker, and then we have something that is much closer to the artist, the researcher, and the learner. But this artist who's creating something unique, okay, it's not the kind of genius art of a Picasso or a Steve Jobs that comes up with the iPhone or something like that. Not at all. This is the, the challenge of creativity that's related to each person. So if I wanted to create a unique product, a unique creation for each person in this room, a pen for each one of you, I could have a huge team building up a, ma a massive catalog and give you the chance to choose in the catalog. Or I could get you to do the creative work. I could get you to think about what kind of pen you like, how you would want to build it. And to tease your imagination, the technology's coming. It pushes over this dichotomy, this, ca this dualism in our minds between supply and demand. We organize our thinking using these concepts. They're not permanent. They were invented. And we can invent new ones. And so just for a second to tease your imagination, some of you may have seen The Economist about three or four weeks ago. They had a cover story on this technology. It's called Desktop Factory, and it produces physical objects by going back and forth, back and forth over the object. And just recently, this group put together, using computer-assisted design and manufacturing techniques, printed them out and put them together, and in three weeks they built a prop engine. And just before Christmas in Las Vegas, they announced the first car produced using prototype printers. Okay, so the technology is moving along. But the point I'm trying to make is imagine if you had a desktop factory. Imagine if you were producing toys and phones and all those things on your desktop. What happens to all those ships going from Taiwan and from China with toys and with, and with... Things can happen, things can change. But technology's not destiny. Because think of the property rights problem associated with doing that. Because if MP3 was something that was so unbelievable uh, from the point of view of property rights protection and the existing asset holders defending their position, Sony and all the rest, what would it be like if it was General Motors and, and Toyota and, and Renault trying to protect their, their property rights? So it's not to say that it's destiny, but what this challenges is one of the fundamental aspects of our current economic organization and our current conceptualization of value creation. What creates value? What creates wealth? What creates the economic foundation that will make us feel secure and likely to be able to continue to, to, to lead a good life, so-called? It's this approach, this hierarchical approach, and we are in the pinnacle of the hierarchical approach. Oxford, Cambridge, the Oxford system is a pyramid knowledge system. But what we're doing here is not a pyramid knowledge system. We're creating collective intelligence. We're trying to develop new ways, and I feel that that's very exciting. We're actually practicing it. And we're moving into systems such as network just in time, do it yourself, refinement of taste and choice, experience and identity. And we're creating the conditions for something I call a murmuration. Now, let's see if I can put the video on. It's a visual metaphor. This is a visual metaphor for an economy uh, where firms are no longer central, where you change your role all the time. It's a fluid economy. This is actually not a complex system. This is a simple system. But it's endogenous, meaning it's self-organizing. And it's fluid. And what I think is really actually central to me is that the center and periphery shift and move. And that you can have changing relationships and changing purposes all the time in this system. Imagine an economy like that. Imagine a continuous recreation of communities like this community. Communities used to be something that were static, that were protected, that were defended with walls, that were defended with property rights. Managerial structures, territorial domains, managers who controlled their turf. In this context, that doesn't work. And it doesn't work if we use the most 
powerful and successful mechanism we've ever invented called administration. If I have to wait when I decide to go up or down, left or right, for somebody to fill in a form or my boss to say yes or no or the policeman to say go or stop, it's not going to work. It doesn't work that way. So it's a profound shift in the organizational underpinnings of daily life. I'm going to finish with just a few points about how the social and the governance connect to this murmuration idea. So I really want to try and offer here two words. One is murmuration, which I think is a great word. It sounds nice. I like it. Um, but it's a word you know, that, that I want to associate with this visual image and something to help you play with something that breaks outside the existing systems. The other word that is very important for me is heterarchical. Heterarchy is something that's absolutely fundamental to what's going on in the world around us today. What is heterarchy? Really simple. Hierarchy is rich, poor. Heterarchy is the happiness of a rich person and the happiness of a poor person. You can't compare them. Many, many things that we're confronting today are about heterarchy. They're about the learning that you're having and the learning that you're having. They're both great. They're both yours. We don't compare them. And freedom and lifestyles and the capacity to be yourself, those are heterarchical things. And if we st start thinking about how to govern that, how to manage it, it probably can't be managed. Not in that way. And if we start to think about how we're going to produce metrics for it, the old way of doing metrics probably won't work. So we've got a lot of inventing to do. We have a lot of daring will be needed. Very quickly about identity and choice. Part of this model for thinking and imagining about the future has to do with the idea of social affiliation and decisions. Less choice, more choice. And the idea that as you move from mass production society to some form of green learning intensive society, there's much greater fluidity. But there's a huge challenge in that. That means we have to construct it. Look, even in this meeting, our ability to trust each other, to understand each other, to negotiate meaning and sense-making frameworks amongst each other has been difficult. It takes time. It takes effort. We're already breaking a lot of rules here. That's great. It shows that, in fact, we're thinking about that transition. We're trying to work it out. We're letting our guts guide us in the you. But it means it pushes us beyond some of the old dichotomies. Again, challenge the way you describe the future. The way you describe the future defines how you see the present. It defines the systemic foundations, the kind of system that you have in your head that, sh that lets you see or not see emergence, novelty, the beauty and the wonder of complexity. And all of that really, in this model, in any case, connects up to the capacity to make decisions. And as we get more transparency and as we experiment more, you get this kind of capacity for spontaneity. And I want to underscore that this is a capacity. And that's why I talk about futures literacy. For us, it seems self-evident that in an industrial society, people are literate. You can find your way around the city because you can look at the street signs. You don't get hurt on the job because you can see when it says danger. Those things are now self-evident. But how do we live with the Senian challenge, Amrata Sen, the capacity to be free? We're not simply just liberated from the oppression, but we also have to be able to exercise our freedom. And in that context, there's huge potential for us to not simply say, oh, I'm going to devalorize and throw away my stories, throw away my way of thinking and living because there's something better that I'm converging to. But if you're open to being able to construct your own frames for seeing the novelty and the potential of your present, you can actually begin to think of a completely different development path. But you have to be able to reframe. So I'm going to end with this quote from Lao Tzu. If you overesteem great men, people become powerless. If you overvalue possessions, people begin to steal. The master leads by emptying people's minds and filling their cores, by weakening their ambition and toughening their resolve. He helps people lose everything they know, everything they desire, and creates confusion in those who think they know. Practice not doing, and everything will fall into place. I've been trying all my life to understand what Lao Tzu meant by not doing. 
And for me, one aspect of not doing is my ability to reframe, my ability to let go of the assumptions and the systemic framework that I'm using to describe the future. And by then reinventing the future, not as a goal, not as something I predict, but as something that I can then use to re-perceive the potential of the present. In a way, I am not doing with respect to what I thought was there. I'm letting it go and finding another way. So I don't know if you can see this. I got this for my 50th birthday uh, a little while ago now. Uh, it's a painting by Sampe. It shows uh, a person ca leading a crowd across a precipice. Oftentimes, that's the imperative. And boy, talk about anxiety. Sure, we should feel really anxious. If that's the idea, this meeting must figure out how to get from A to B. A is dangerous, B is safe. Now take us across the precipice at this, you know, that's, that, that little guy up there, that's our action lab. We're the action lab. We're going to have to take everybody across the precipice. I don't think so. How we anticipate matters, it changes the present. This time around, it isn't what kind of future, green, blue, red, or black, that you imagine. So we're not doing what Jules Verne did, some extrapolation. We're not doing what some utopians did, describing some utopian future. It's not what future that matters this time. This time around, it's how we think about the future. Thank you. <laughs>